All right, we're just going to wait a few moments for everyone to drop on in. Hopefully my microphone is working fine. Okay. Give everyone a few moments to drop on in. I think everything is check, check, check. All right, well, let's get this show on the road. Greetings, tech art fans from around the world. It is Friday. It is 1230, which means it is time for another episode of Tech Art Talk Live. And you know what? I'm afraid that my, my man here is causing a lot of audio disturbances, so I'm going to go ahead and take this off. Oh, there we go. All right, and if you haven't figured out that uh, today we are celebrating Halloween here at uh, University of Central Florida, so we are in the uh, Halloween festive mode. So welcome. Uh, now we've going on for the last few weeks, actually a bunch of weeks now for the last couple of months, about HLSL programming and so forth and the lighting and, and shading pipeline, and we're going to finish off this overall series with this last segment which is all about shadow mapping. Now shadow mapping is something that you gotta have in order to make stuff look real. And shadow mapping it's a little bit more complicated and it's a little bit more involved but it's nothing beyond what we haven't talked about already. There's just a lot of it. So therefore we're not going to be doing a lot of shader programming today but really more or less demonstrating how this stuff all works. So let me go ahead and get my uh, uh, let me get my PowerPoint up here and going. So let's right on right right yeah. Let's run right off onto the lecture. Okay, as I mentioned before, shadows is something that you really got to incorporate, and the shadowing has to happen within the shader itself. Unless you're actually doing something like blob map shadows or some kind of other artificial uh, shadowing technique, uh, you got to have some kind of shadowing. And the most common technique is called shadow mapping. Okay, come on, let's get this thing moving. Okay, all right now. In this process, in these next three weeks, including today, uh, we're going to be doing a shadow mapping. And we're going to be breaking it up into three easy to digest installments. This week, we're going to be working on projection mapping. And we're going to be going on and dealing with projection mapping and reverse projection mapping. And that's going to pretty much cover today's lecture. Next week, we're going to be going on into depth mapping. Now, depth mapping is an essential component for actually pulling off something that is called occlusion mapping. And occlusion mapping is what we're going to be doing in the third weekend. And really, the transition from occlusion mapping to true shadow mapping is really just a flick of a couple of expressions, and you're ready to rock and roll. So what we're going to be doing is, once again, we're going to be doing projection mapping this week. Next week, we'll be going on to depth mapping. And then the final third week, we're going to be going on to, into final occlusion mapping and full-blown shader mapping. All right. So let's get things rolling about talking about projection mapping. The projection mapping is cool. You may have seen it like uh, you know, over at Disney World and so forth. Believe it or not, the Cinderella's Castle does not actually look like this. It's really fancy. And it's what does it have? It's got projectors and it's projecting computer graphic imagery right on top of it. And that's exactly what shadows are, folks. Believe it or not, it's what is the, uh, it's actually light or a shadow, a texture projected from a light at some point onto an object and it's projected onto a service. And so we have a little bit of like Cinderella's castle showing a little bit of detail. And here's this interesting thing about uh, looking at uh, the, uh, uh, the river inside of England. Uh, the head, uh, and there is the Credible Hulk calling this, but I think that was just projected onto the side, maybe onto a, uh, a glass in order for dramatic effect. Okay, 
a little bit looks like this. It's kind of like the bat signal, if you can imagine. Okay, so what we have here is a shadow is really, we gotta get a light source, and then we're gonna project the shadow directly from the light source onto the surface. So normally the light projects light onto the surface, but in this case, we're also going to project a texture map from it. And that texture map is going to be having a very specific kind of shape and size. And actually that's gonna be the original contents of the world. Okay, in order to pull this off, we need to create something called a projective texture mapping. And so what it is, like just like we have for the camera where we have a, uh, a view frustum, which is the kind of like pyramid shaped structure with a near claim and a far clipping plane, and then we got the perspective going at it, we're gonna have to do the exact same thing, but instead of actually projecting from a camera, we're gonna be projecting from a light. And in order to get that done, we're gonna to have to do something with something called NDC space or normalized device coordinate space. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, when we're dealing with texture maps, we have to get the texture map positioned into the right place into the world in order to get it to show up correctly. And in other words, what we have to do is the, uh, we need to go between negative one and one but our normal texture maps are just mapped between range zero to one, both in the U and the V directions. And so what we have to do is we have to come up with this scaling matrix where the U is multiplied by 0.5 and then 0.5 added onto it, and V has a negative 0.5 multiplied against it with another 0.5 minute. And so when you actually put all those pieces together, you end up with a scaling metric, uh, a scaling matrix that looks like this, and this is what we have to do. And so this is what we have to involve us. And so this isn't gonna be multiplied against our normal camera world view projection settings. We're gonna actually multiply this against the camera. I mean, uh, against the light. And the light also has to get projected in into world space. It has to get projected into view space and then it has to get projected into um, perspective space. And then once it's been multiplied by all that, then it finally goes into this kind of like NDC space, which is just screen space. And then so we're adjusting the texture map to fit into the right direction. And so here's what it is. So we're gonna treat the light as if it was a camera. And so we're gonna have this is going to end up with one thing called the projective texture matrix. And um, I'm not going to show you how to do this in code because uh, I didn't actually have the code for understanding the right projection uh, matrices and I couldn't figure that out. But we're going to start off with the objects world matrix. So that's the objects we're, we're talking about. Then we're going to multiply that by the lights view matrix. And the lights view matrix is exactly the same as if we're going to treat that light as if it was a camera. And then we're going to get its light matrix from that. And then we're going to take that light's projection matrix. And so once again, we're going to be pretend that this light is actually a camera. And so we're going to get its view matrix and its projection matrix out of that. And then finally, once we've multiplied all that, then we're going to finally multiply it by our texture scaling matrix. And that will get us into our appropriate NDC space. Now, when we're dealing with NDC space, uh, remember, we're going to be dealing with matrices. And uh, if you look at, at Tech Art Talk Live, we do go into matrices and we do go into projection mapping or, and we do go into, into projection space and to view space. And so if you need a refresher on that, go back, oh, probably by about six months or so, and then we go back, look where I deal with matrix operations and dealing with um, uh, spatial transformations, and that's what we're dealing with here. But anyway, once we compute our object's position in U and V space, then we have to divide it through by W again in order to get it into the proper NDC space. So that's just a little caveat to consider when dealing with this uh, scale matrix in order to deal with the lights uh, view projection matrix in order to actually project the texture on for us. Okay, so let's take a look at what this uh, what this is actually going to look like. 
So I'm going to change this over to my shader tool view. Now, I realize that the shader tool right now looks like a school of spaghetti. And that is because there is a lot of stuff and a lot of moving parts that goes along with any kind of shadow mapping. But that's okay. Uh, that's why we're not going to be doing much sh actual sh coding today. I'm going to be showing you what the code looks like. And so I am going to go ahead and move this over here. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do, I'm going to pop, pop this up over here. Let's take a look at the shader. And let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. And it's a little bit bigger. All right, so the first line of our shader is that we're going to call in the common fxh file. Now, this is the same common fxh file that we developed, oh golly, by about four or five weeks ago when we're dealing with just basic standard lighting because what we're doing is we're duplicating uh, basic lighting, but instead of using standardized lighting, we're going to be using a light as if it was a, if it was a camera. And so we're going to look our, our we have our C buffer per frame. And so as input, we're going to want the view matrix. We're going to want the projection matrix. We're going to want our ambient color, our light color, and our light position, which is kind of ordinary, and our light radius. Remember, this is the attenuation radius, so it kind of falls off. And then we have our camera position. And then for our C buffer per object, then we're going to deal with the world position of the object, the specular color, the specular power of the object, and the specular and the projective texture matrix. Now this is the really dicey thing. Now notice that this is coming in as an input. Now you're probably asking, well, couldn't we have just inputted that and performed all this in the shader? And I said, yes, we probably could, but then we would have increased the size of our shader significantly, and we would have never gotten out of here. And we want to keep this lecture in at a reasonable amount of time. All right, the C buffer per frame is the worldview projection matrix, and that is the standard worldview projection matrix that we typically always deal with. Now, for our textures, we're going to be dealing with two textures. We're going to be dealing with the texture of the surface that we're actually projecting on, and then we're going to have this projected texture. Now, here I am, I'm using the smoking skull. Uh, texture, and this is actually what's the, going to be projected onto my standard texture map, which is nothing but a checkerboard square. And we're going to have two color, uh, two texture samplers: one for the normal color of our object, and we're going to use min, mag, mip, linear filter. And then for the address view and the address v, we're going to use wrapping. But for our projected texture sampler, we're going to want just, we're going to use the mid map linear, but we're going to call this address U and address V. We're going to use border mapping. So that means whatever color is on the borders of our texture image, we're going to get propagated out. And ultimately, I'm going to give you a hint. Because it's white, it comes across as just white light, so it doesn't do anything. And that's why our border color is going to get filled in with white color all the way through. OK, so let's take a look at our data structures that we're going to be dealing with. Now, this is the exact same data structure that we've used before. And there really, we're not going to be dealing with anything except for one slight example. As our input, we're going to take our object position, our texture coordinate, and our object or our surface normal here. That is the very typical. On the output, however, we're going to end up with our position. We're going to end up with our normal. We're going to end up with our texture coordinate, our world position. And of course, we're dealing with the light attenuation because we're dealing with net or light. But we're going to also deal with the projected texture coordinates. OK, now this is where the actual texture map has been projected into NDC space, or we're calling it projected texture coordinate space. OK. Now let's take a look at the vertex shader. The vertex shader is pretty standard. Um, the first step is we compute the world view projection matrix. And that, that's exactly what we do. We're multiplying the world matrix against the view matrix, and then finish in multiplying it by the projection matrix. 
our, we've got our position. So we're taking our object position and we're transforming it into worldview projection space by just simply multiplying it against that vector. And so we've got our position is nothing but our, uh, our object position multiplied by the world matrix. And mind you, for this, we only want the x, y, and z coordinate. Now, here's our texture coordinate. We're just going to get it from our get corrected texture coordinate function, which has been tried and true all the way through. And our normal texture, uh, we're going to get our normalized component, where we're going to get our in normal. We're going we're to get the normal vector. We're going to transform it into world space by multiplying by the world matrix. And then we're going to just simply get the x, y, z component of that. And then we're going to normalize it, meaning that we're going to make the magnitude of 1 and just keep things going in between the values of 0 and 1. So here we have our light direction. And then from that, we're going to calculate our light attenuation. OK, nothing new. The only new thing we're dealing with here is our projected texture coordinates. And really, all, and that's all we're going to be doing is multiplying our in dot object position. And we're going to multiply that by our projective texture matrix. And really, that's all that's being done here. Now, creating the world, creating the projective texture matrix is a little bit of a bear, but we'll go into that later. But inside of the shader in itself, the HLSL is almost trivial. It's like falling off of a horse. All right, so let's take a look at the pixel shader. Now, the pixel shader is actually pretty straightforward. As you can guess, we've got our light direction and our view direction, our color and our ambient values. OK, this is all standard textbook. HSL, HLSL Lighting 101. And then we're going to plug all that data into a light contribution data and just crank on through that. And then we end up with our ambient uh, plus our end attenuation multiplied by the color contribution. And then we have on this. OK, now we have to deal with the shadow that is getting projected onto that. Now, this is where some of the magic happens. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to transform our projected texture coordinate space into NDC space, and so we're going to divide through by the W component. If we don't W, if we don't divide through by the W component, it's going to look all wonky. So make sure to always divide through by your W component in order to get the projected texture coordinates. Then we're going to get those projected texture coordinates. We're going to get those from our projected texture map. We're not going to get it from the normal colorized map. We're going to get it from the projected texture map. All right, once we have that, then we're just going to multiply the red, green, and blues by the results of our projected color. Now, remember, it's important that we are using bordering for the address U and the address V components and then putting the border color as white. And notice that my texture map here is going to end up being black and white. And so therefore, anything that multiplies against white, which is a value of 1, will look 1. And anything that multiplies against black, which is 0, is going to end up at 0. So let's take a look at the demonstration that we have here. OK, now we've got a lot of stuff going on here. Now we could manipulate our camera to kind of swing around here. And we're looking at some wild things, and it's not necessarily looking the way we want it to. But there it is. But suppose we wanted to actually rotate our cube around here. We could do that by here's our world space object, and we have uh, the full-blown gamut here where we've got translations, we've got scales, and then we have rotations. And just to show this, I'm just going to rotate just the cube here. And as you can see here, we're rotating the cube. But you'll notice that the projection on top of it stays exactly the same and conforms to the size no, no matter what it does here. OK. And now this is all looking kind of wonky here. Actually, what I want to do is I want to get rid of that. And I want to create a new rotation matrix here in order to get the contents in there. <laughs> OK, get a new rotation matrix put that right in here so everything should clean up. There it goes, nice and smooth. Okay, now let's start dealing with let's start dealing with our light. Now our light is a little bit complicated and so it's got a lot of stuff here. And so we can move our light 
left and right and horizontal. So here we are, we can, uh, where's our light information? So we've got a worldview to rotation. And so this moves our, okay, this moves the object. Where's my, um, Where's my transition for my light? Okay, here we are, the light position. So if we wanted to move it left and right, so it looks like we're moving the right, the light to the left, then to the right. And likewise, if we wanted to move it up and down, notice that the projection changes on that when we move that around. Okay, so we're now moving the light projection and then likewise we can change what the light look lo look at is so this kind of behaves like a spotlight as well so we have our light look at and so we can move the look at kind of like to the left or to the right and then we can move it up or move it down okay so what we have here is the light view matrix and so we have the light look at combined with the light position and what that does is this gives us the light view matrix and then we also have to take into consideration our attenuation but we're not going to deal with that right now so ultimately what we're going to do is going to take the light view matrix and we'll multiply it by the world space position of our light and that's going to give us a world view then the difficult part here is that we have to create our brand or our own projection matrix from that. Luckily, Shader Tool provides a little bit of an insert where we can create, it provides the formula for calculating the projection matrix for us. And so that's cool. And so all we need to do is provide it with an aspect ratio, which is an aspect ratio of one, so I'm keeping it kind of square. And then we have to provide a field of view, which is oh, like, like 120 degrees. And so we can make our thing a little bit wonky and, and that's crazy. And so we're just going to leave it right there as it begins. And we can manipulate the near plane and the, and the far plane, and that will control the amount of clipping. So we're going to get our world view, and then we're going to multiply it by the projection matrix. And then we're going to get our world view projection matrix for our light. And the only thing left to do after that is then to multiply it by our NDC matrix, or otherwise, this is going to per, this is going to scale our texture for that. And so, what we're going to end up with is our projection texture matrix, which is also the world matrix times the view matrix times the projection matrix times the scaling matrix. Ugh. I told you that was a bit of a bear to create. And so that gets plugged into the projective matrix projective texture matrix slot on here and then we have on here so notice now that our light is now projecting onto our surface and that moves all around there okay great okay so what's the next thing we want to do with that okay suppose that we're projecting a texture but what happens if some kind of object gets in the way of it because ultimately what we're doing is we're using this to model shadow mapping but obviously something's going to get in the way of our object so how do we deal with that occlusion inside of the shadow map and that is what we're going to be dealing with again on next week and so what we're going to do is 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 move that on so be patient and so you're going to have to tune again next week and when we Go, where we go in and we're not going to solve the occlusion absolutely directly instead what we're going to develop is an essential technique kind of like this projection map called depth mapping and this depth mapping is going to be the greater uh, control function that's going to control um, how we're going to deal with this occlusion all right so that's what I wanted to deal with you folks today and so if you want to go check out the next part, you're going to have to tune in next week. And next week is going to be on 11.5 in November. God, can you believe it's November already? Unbelievable. 12.30 p.m. And tune in because we're going to be dealing with the shadow mapping part 2. And we're going to be dealing with depth mapping. Okay, folks, that's all that we have on schedule for today's session. So if you like what you see, go ahead and subscribe to the channel by clicking on the little subscribe button. And otherwise, check me out. My name is Chris Rota. Check me out on Facebook and on LinkedIn. Otherwise, check out TechArt EDU, which is the kind of like the umbrella over this whole operation. And you can check us out on Facebook and on LinkedIn as well. All right, folks, thank you very much for joining us today. 
Have a wild and wacky, wonderful Halloween. And I look forward to talking with you again next week when we start dealing with depth mapping. And until then, Arrivederci. Have a great week. <laughs>